Isuzu Trooper customers want to be prepared. Prepared for even the most difficult marginal traction situations. Prepared for whatever adventure may find them. At the same time, they want and deserve all the comforts and conveniences that are normally found only in luxury sedans. No other vehicle offers your customers both traction conquering abilities and sedan-like amenities the way the Trooper does. To prove it, Insights took the Trooper along with the luxury leader, the Range Rover, the best seller, the Ford Explorer, the new flagship of the best known line of sport utilities, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, and the Trooper's closest import competitor, the Mitsubishi Montero, to Anza Borrego Desert State Park in Southern California. Harry Llewellyn, a professional off-highway driver, acts as our guide through this challenging terrain. If the Trooper can handle these grueling surfaces, it can easily handle the on-highway traction conditions its owners might face. But the Trooper offers more, so Insights invited American Isuzu's training and information manager, Brian Block, to tell us how. After you've seen these comparisons, you'll understand why the Isuzu Trooper is the best-selling luxury import sport utility in America, and why, in terms of comfort and capability, the Trooper remains at the top. California's Anza Borrego Desert State Park is the largest in the continental United States. It's over a thousand square miles. It's covered with off-highway vehicle trails and beautiful scenery. We're taking the one-way Pinion Mountain Road to prove the abilities of these SUVs. The trail requires skills and experience you don't gain on the first trip out. But it's a good road to show the off-highway capabilities of these vehicles because it challenges every aspect of them. There are three main obstacles. First, there's the squeeze, a 74-inch gap between two granite boulders. Then, there's the diagonal teeter-totters, where one wheel on each axle comes off the ground and makes it difficult to climb the hill. Finally, there's Heart Attack Hill, a 60-degree slope that is so steep and so rocky, the park rangers give you about a 50-50 chance of rolling going down. At first, the road looks easy. You can get through the first seven miles without using four-wheel drive. But about this point, many drivers consider turning around. This is called the squeeze or the fat man's misery. As you can tell by looking around, there's no way to go around it. You're stopped. You obviously ought to get out and look. And uh, you have a lot of time to peruse the terrain, make sure it's flat and level. So you yeah. don't have to shift on the fly. I don't have shift on the fly. Two things that really help is one, narrow in width, not only overall vehicle width, but tread width. If your tires stick out too far, they could rub too much and not let you fit. Also, a little stiffer, more firm suspension helps because as you will watch the vehicles come through, they'll jostle, rock back and forth, left to right. Bring it forward, bring it forward. All right, straighten it out, keep coming. Turn right a little bit. The Trooper gets through very well. It has some nice features that accommodate easy passage. The folding mirrors are a real asset in this kind of situation. I want you to fold in the mirrors. Okay. Keep coming forward. Little bit right. Good. Little bit right. Good. All right. Keep coming. Keep coming. Slow and easy. Good job. Okay, sweep it. There's a couple of tricks to getting through the squeeze. You want your front tire to be scuffing that rock. And you have to be careful on the Explorer because of the long wheelbase. It can get hung up underneath. Most drivers feel they're home free about this point. What's actually going to happen is if you turn right, you're going to cause some damage on the left rear side of the car. And uh, so you have to go further straight than you would think you would, and then turn sharper right to get through. Okay, down on the left, gentle, easy. Forward, keep coming forward. Just gentle. Okay, down on the right again. Be ready, slow and easy, good job. 
Okay, cut it. Nice and gentle down off that rock. A little bit to your right. That's good. Keep coming. You're gonna slip off a rock, slow and easy. A little bit to your right. A little bit to your right. A little bit more to your right. There you go. Keep coming. Hold up. The reason you had to make that little extra correction right there was this grill guard sticking out. You're having a problem with the Montero? It won't go into four-wheel drive low range. Okay, what I'm going to do is show you the process I go through, find out whether there's anything wrong or whether um, it's just operator error. We're in neutral. I can't get it out. It says press down. I'm trying pressing down. Um, it feels pretty stiff. I think there's something wrong. We could do this part up here in the squeeze. The problem is, is that we're going to reach a point of no return. Quite frankly, I think it's dangerous to go down Heart Attack Hill without low range working. Uh, I'd prefer that we leave the car. Huh. Okay. Let's That's go. my preference. We've got a long, steep hill to climb here. What that means is we're going to run into diagonal teeter-totter. That means uh, the axles will tilt a lot. You'll end up with one tire on one axle off the ground, another tire on the other axle off the ground. You don't move. Notice how we've got to do a lot of extra turning. We swing way left, and then we swing way right. You'll notice that limited slip differentials help here because they've transferred power to the tire that's on the ground. We've just taken on two of the challenges of the Pinion Mountain Trail, but this next challenge is the real test. This is Heart Attack Hill. This hill is really steep. When you first come up to it and look down, it looks impossible to do. You're going to start slipping over the edge with the front tires and then watch the rear tire come off of the ground. The driver is actually under control. The vehicles are actually designed to take this kind of use. This is not abuse, this is designed in use. Cars don't need to be modified. Stock vehicles do fine on this hill. There's no particular preparation for any of the vehicles that we've used, and the designers anticipate this kind of use. Tire coming off of the ground is completely normal in backcountry travel. Sport utility vehicles four-wheel drive gives me the ability to get in the backcountry to see things that aren't available to other people, just a lot of aspects that aren't available to those who stay on the paved roads. Your trooper customers will rarely encounter traction conditions like these, but they want to know they'll be prepared if they're confronted by them. Clearly the trooper meets or exceeds the abilities of the best of the breed. Now the question becomes how well does the trooper compete when it's not facing treacherous driving conditions? Let's find out. In terms of price, the Range Rover is clearly at the top of the SUV class. It's the prestige leader and many buyers will choose it for that reason alone. This is the county model. And at $44,500, it's almost $20,000 more than the base price of a Trooper LS. Now, you might be asking yourself, why are we comparing them? Well, for two reasons. First of all, the Range Rover is acknowledged by four-wheel drive experts as an extremely competent off-highway vehicle. And second, perhaps because of its price, the Range Rover is the perceived benchmark in its class in terms of luxury. 
Now in Anza Borrego, we proved that the Trooper could keep up with the Range Rover on even the most challenging of terrains. To help understand why, let's take a look underneath both of them. One of the reasons that the Range Rover is such a good off-highway performer is that it has a really strong frame. The Range Rover uses four-sided frame rails, which are known as box section frame rails. This type of rail offers maximum resistance to twisting and bending. The Trooper also uses a box section frame. The Range Rover has one skid plate. It's located under the fuel tank and it only partially covers it. However, some components are protected due to their location. For example, the oil pan, which is right here, is protected by this front axle. And the transmissions pan, which is protected by this cross member. But these steering components, the catalytic converters, and the transfer case are completely exposed. The Trooper, on the other hand, has five skid plates. This one here protects the front suspension components, the oil filter housing, and the steering components. And this one, the exhaust header pipe and the transmission. The one over there, the transfer case, and this one, the catalytic converter. And the one all the way back there protects the fuel tank and it covers it completely. When you look at these two vehicles from underneath, it's clear how the Trooper can keep up with the Range Rover, even over the most difficult terrain. But when it comes to aesthetics, ergonomics, and passenger comfort, it's the Range Rover that needs to keep up with the Trooper. The shape of the Range Rover clearly says 1970, and that's appropriate since that's the year it was introduced. The square corners, large rain gutters, are not the marks of modern aerodynamic efficiency. Neither are the large gaps between the body panels. They do, however, help disguise the misalignment of these panels. The Trooper has rounded corners, integrated drip rails, and close-fitting body panels that not only reduce wind noise, but they also make a tighter seal against dust, mud, snow, and water. The narrow gaps and perfectly aligned body panels give the Trooper a refined and luxurious look. The Range Rover's leather-covered driver's seat is electrically adjustable to just about any position, but the steering wheel, unfortunately, isn't. And the interior is laid out for British drivers, so the operating controls are not in places where most Americans would expect to find them. For example, the dome light switch is over here. And to open the fuel door, you push this button on the side of the steering column. And the horn switch is right where you'd expect to find it, on the end of the directional. One Range Rover owner told me that by the time she remembers where the horn is, she no longer needs it. So she usually just hits the wheel and screams. The Trooper's driver's seat is also adjustable to almost any position. But in the Trooper, you can adjust the steering wheel's position too. And all the controls are just where you'd expect to find them. Like here and here. The Range Rover is over eight inches shorter than the Trooper. A lot of that room is taken out of the back seat area, which makes it tough to get in. Once you do finally get in, you really don't want to stay here too long. It's even tougher to get out. The shortness of the Range Rover, combined with this inside mounted spare tire location, means that you have a small cargo area, whether the seat is up or down. The Trooper has over six inches more rear seat legroom. So even with the seat all the way back, there's plenty of room for me. And there's even a footrest, just like a limousine. And because it's taller, there's over two inches more headroom. With the rear seat up, the Trooper has almost 10 cubic feet more cargo space. And with the seat folded, the Trooper has 20 cubic feet more cargo space. The Range Rover uses an all aluminum engine. It's a 3.9 liter V8 that was designed by Buick in 1960 for the 1961 Buick Special. In 1963, when Buick decided to discontinue the engine, General Motors sold the dies to what is now the Rover Group. The Trooper also has an all aluminum engine, but it's a smaller, more modern V6 that puts out more horsepower. In fact, the Trooper gets from zero to 60 over a second faster and gets better gas mileage to boot. So, while the Range Rover customer may not be shopping the Trooper LS, your customers will still be interested to know that the Trooper offers the same rugged off-highway performance that the Range Rover is famous for, and it does it in a more modern package that provides better fit, finish, room, power, and fuel economy. Most SUV shoppers will be seriously considering the Ford Explorer. It's a sales leader in the compact sport utility market and is the primary challenger to any SUV. This is the new top of the line model called the Limited. The Limited features a new front fascia, some interesting color combinations, these new wheels, and those running boards. 
as well as a higher level of standard equipment that includes air conditioning, anti-theft system, keyless remote entry, automatic transmission, and leather seats. Mechanically, however, the Limited is identical to other Explorer models. Thirty years ago, Ford introduced the twin I-beam independent front suspension. It was a clear improvement in comfort over the heavier solid front axle. The heavier the suspension, the harder it is for the tires to keep up with changes in the road surface. Now, 30 years later, Ford still uses it. On four-wheel drive models, it's called twin traction beam. You can see the two separate beams, one going to each wheel. There's a liability to this design, however. You see there's a single pivot point for each one of these wheels. Now, for this wheel, that pivot point is right over here. And what happens is, as this wheel moves up and down in reaction to bumps in the road, it moves in an arc like this. And this causes the tire to actually move back and forth along the ground as the tire is rolling forward. This movement is known as scrubbing. And the problem with that is, it causes excessive tire wear, not to mention poor steering response and control. So it's no wonder that Automotive News reported that Ford plans to discontinue the twin I-beam and the twin traction beam suspensions on not only the Explorer, but also the Ranger in 1995. The Trooper's double wishbone front suspension has two arms going to each wheel. You can see these two arms here. There's one on the bottom and one up there. And if it looks a little rough, that's because we painted over the extensive undercoating. And because there are two arms, the pivot point is effectively moved far away from the wheel, outside of the car, in fact, which limits the arcing motion to the point that the Trooper's wheels remain virtually perpendicular to the road at all times. Scrubbing is practically eliminated, which reduces tire wear and improves steering response. The Trooper's double wishbone front suspension is also lighter than the twin traction beam setup, allowing it to react more quickly to changes in the road surface. All this adds up to better tire-to-ground contact, more control for the driver, and more comfort inside. The Explorer has a C-type frame. It's called a C-type because it's shaped like the letter C. One side is open, so the frame isn't nearly as resistant to bending and twisting as the Trooper's box section frame and the Explorer's frame is two inches closer to the ground. And when you look under here, you can see that there's no undercoating. The Explorer comes standard with a four-wheel anti-lock braking system. And while four-wheel ABS is great, its effectiveness depends on the components it's controlling. The Explorer components include ventilated disc brakes in the front, but drum brakes in the rear. Drum brakes dissipate heat more slowly than disc brakes and are more likely to fade after heavy repeated use. Take a look. The drum is completely sealed. There's absolutely no place for any air to get in to keep the brakes cool. As a matter of fact, you can't even see the brakes. But you can see the rust that's already starting to form. And this vehicle only has 49 miles on it. The Trooper's four-wheel ABS system is optional, but the components of the Trooper system include disc brakes on all four wheels, and they're all ventilated. And what we mean by ventilated is there are slots in the disc. We've removed the caliper and the pad so you can see them. See these slots here? air actually runs through the center of the disc as it's turning, keeping the disc cool at all times. And what this means is that if you're going down a long hill, especially when you're pulling a trailer, the trooper's brakes will still be there when you get to the bottom. One of the nicest luxury features in any car is a nice big sliding sunroof. So it's too bad that you can't get one in the top of the line Explorer. If you want one in an Explorer, you'll have to make do with this small glass pop-up type sunroof that can also be removed. It doesn't come with a sunshade. And in the Explorer, if you want this optional CD player, you'll have to give up the standard cassette. The Trooper offers customers this huge sunroof and this sunshade. And when you open it up, this wind deflector is automatically deployed. The Trooper comes standard with an AM FM cassette player and you don't have to give it up when you order the optional CD. The Explorer's rear seats don't recline, nor do they offer the safety or comfort of rear headrests like the Trooper seats do. And though the Explorer is perceived as a large family vehicle, the rear cargo capacity is smaller than the Trooper's, about eight cubic feet smaller with the seat down. And with the seat up, it's about five cubic feet smaller. And when you pull this cargo cover into place, the single rear speaker is completely covered. Besides having a larger cargo area, the Trooper's two rear speakers are located up high, so when you pull the cover into place, you still have high fidelity sound. Down here is the Explorer's spare tire. Now the Ford salesperson will probably say that it saves cargo space and doesn't obstruct rear visibility having it down here, but probably won't point out that it's mounted on a black steel rim that doesn't match the rest of the rims on the vehicle, which are aluminum. 
and there are some problems associated with using it. Not only will the spare be dirty from road grime that is accumulated, but once you've gotten down on your hands and knees to remove it, you'll be dirty too. Now Ford gives you this pair of gloves, but they probably should really just give you knee pads. Now you could call roadside assistance if the vehicle came with it, but of course it doesn't. The trooper carries its covered spare tire on the outside. Underneath this cover, you'll find an aluminum wheel that matches the rest of the rims on the vehicle. And for five years of 60,000 miles, you don't even have to change it because the Isuzu comes with roadside assistance and they'll do it for you free of charge. Even though the Ford has a larger engine, it only puts out 160 horsepower, which is no match for the Trooper's 190 horsepower performance. When your customers look at the Trooper compared to the Explorer, they'll see the Trooper has a stronger frame, more ground clearance, a more sophisticated and powerful engine, more fade-resistant ventilated disc brakes on all four wheels, a roomier, more comfortable rear seat, and a larger cargo area. So while your customers may want to explore the Ford, when they look at the Trooper, they'll discover it's the better value for their money. When we took the Mitsubishi Montero LS to the Anza Borrego Desert State Park, we were disappointed that the transfer case got stuck in four-wheel drive high, forcing us to abandon the vehicle before we got to places that would require four-wheel drive low. Mitsubishi, of course, is known as a manufacturer of high-quality vehicles, so we thought for sure that our test vehicle was an exception and not the rule. As a matter of fact, we weren't even going to mention it. But on page 129 of the May issue, of Car and Driver Magazine, 1993, in an article summing up a long-term test of Montero, we found this. Mile, 25,768. The lever that engages four-wheel drive is stuck in off-road mode. Now, surely these are isolated incidents. After all, according to the Montero's brochure, the Montero LS offers rugged performance tempered by luxury car refinement. And since the Trooper LS offers those same benefits to customers, we'd like to compare the two models now. But, unfortunately, we can't. You see, after the Montero LS broke down in the desert, we found that we couldn't get another LS because, according to Mitsubishi, the Montero LS is no longer available in the western region of the United States, which is where we're located. And it will only be offered on a limited basis in the rest of the country. So we're going to use the Montero SR for this comparison, which is almost identical to the LS, with the exception of a few items, such as the fender flares and the tires. First, let's take a look at rugged performance. The Montero has skid plates, but what they cover is limited. Now, you have this one down here in the front, which does a good job of protecting the front suspension and the oil pan, and you have one over here, which protects the transfer case. But take a look at the one back here covering the fuel tank. It only covers part of the tank. You see, the sides here are completely exposed. So if you hit a rock or something, you're out of luck. Uh, and in the front, there is no protection at all covering the exhaust header pipe or the transmission. In a rugged situation, these things could be a problem. The trooper skid plates completely cover the components it's supposed to protect. See how the one on the fuel tank completely wraps around it? The Montero doesn't offer a limited slip differential on any LS or SR model. So if one rear wheel spins or loses traction, the differential will not transfer power to the other rear wheel that has traction. If you want a limited slip differential in a Montero, you must step down a trim level to the RS model where you'll give up the luxuries of anti-lock brakes, power antenna, headlamp washers, and optional CD player. The Trooper LS, on the other hand, comes standard with a limited slip differential. So if one rear wheel spins or loses traction, the differential will transfer power to the other rear wheel that has traction. The Montero has a three liter, two valve per cylinder, single overhead cam V6 engine that puts out 151 horsepower, which is 39 less than the Trooper LS. This not only gives you less performance, but also a thousand pounds less towing capacity. For a vehicle that claims luxury car refinement, it's surprising to find that the sunroof's in the back seat instead of in the front. And the automatic transmission lever is closer to the passenger than the driver. And this wood trim is not only made of plastic, but it looks like it. The dashboard contains several interesting instruments up here. For example, you have an altimeter so you know how high you are, and an inclinometer that tells you what angle you're at. Then there's this compass that tells you what direction you're going in. Of course, it'll only work if you adjust it for the inclination of the Earth's axis. At least that's what it says in the owner's manual. Chances are these instruments would be of marginal utility to a luxury sport utility buyer. One item that would be useful, though, would be these headlamp washers. Unfortunately, when used the Monteros, they spray the entire front of the car with soapy water. All the troopers' controls are there for a reason, and refine in the way they work. 
For example, the Trooper's headlamp washers have wipers. Now, the wipers spray the fluid directly onto the headlamp and then wipe it off, nice and neat. While the Trooper has no inclinometer, it does feature electrically folding mirrors. At the touch of a button, the mirrors fold in against the body, which is not only useful off-highway in tight places, but also at drive throughs and drive-up cash machines. The rear seat in the Montero reclines <laughs> with great difficulty, I might add, but it's not a split type. So your only choice is to either sit on it or fold it. The Trooper's rear seats give the luxury buyer options. They can be folded all the way forward to maximize cargo room. Exposing this hidden storage compartment that the Montero doesn't offer. Or, unlike the Montero, you can carry one or two passengers and have added cargo space. And if you fold the seat halfway down, as a convenient tabletop. Like the Trooper, the Montero's rear door opens like a door instead of like a hatch. But unlike the Trooper, it's one large and heavy door. And it opens the wrong way. If you're parked along the curb, you have to walk all the way around the door to get in and out. It's not too convenient. The Trooper, on the other hand, uses two doors. We call them the 70-30 split doors. You'll notice that the larger door opens from right to left, so it's easy to walk in and out from the curb to load it. And because it's a shorter door, you can open it at a greater angle in a tighter spot. And if you do need a wider opening, you can always open the little door. And you'll notice these two reflective dots so that when you have them open, people can see them, especially at night. In May 1993, Car and Driver wrapped up a long-term test of the Montero. One of the testers said that the Montero went about its business like a big, dumb, but lovable dog. In terms of rugged performance and luxury car refinement, though, your customers will find that the Trooper is really man's best friend. The newly designed Jeep Grand Cherokee has drawn much attention from the media since its introduction. One of the reasons for all the attention is the availability of a 5.2 liter, 220 horsepower V8 engine. So, even though the Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited normally comes with an inline six cylinder engine that has the same horsepower rating as the Trooper LS, we've equipped this Grand Cherokee with the V8. Now you might say this is an unfair comparison to the Trooper's V6, but we chose the V8 because we knew we could still compete. After all, the only real advantage of the V8 engine is an increased towing capacity. 6,500 pounds when equipped with the optional trailer towing package, and it's a little quicker to 60, but at the expense of fuel economy. Underneath the Jeep, the first thing you'll notice is a lack of a frame. The Jeep uses what's known as unibody construction. You can see it right over here. While this part looks like an actual frame rail, if you look closely, you can see that it's really the same as this piece. It's part of the floor. Every other sport utility, including the Trooper, uses what's known as body-on-frame construction. Now, while I can't end the debate on which is stronger or better, what I can say is that the Jeep is the only vehicle that needed to have its doors realigned after we took it off highway. Another thing you'll notice is a lack of undercoating protection. Now, while there is some along the sides, this whole middle area is completely unprotected. There's nothing on there at all except for some primer and some paint. And if you look here, the drive shaft and the universal joint are already rusted. And so are some of the suspension components. And this is a brand new vehicle with about 20 miles on it. Skid plates are an extra cost option on the Grand Cherokee. You can get them two ways, either separately or as part of what's known as the upcountry suspension group. And we've equipped this Grand Cherokee with the upcountry suspension package because in addition to the skid plates, it also includes these all-terrain tires, tow hooks front and rear, and higher ground clearance, which makes it much more comparable to the way the Trooper comes standard. The skid plates that are here cover the following components. In the front, you have one that protects the suspension components, but leaves many of the steering components wide open. Back here, you have one protecting the transfer case, but as you can see, the transmission and the exhaust header pipe are completely unguarded, as well as this very expensive catalytic converter. There is one in the back, though, that covers the fuel tank completely. Now, the Trooper not only has a box section frame and undercoating, but extensive skid plate protection as standard equipment. Take a look at the front suspension. The Jeep uses a solid front axle. Now, you already know that a solid front axle is the heaviest way to go. And one of the reasons for that is because the differential is built right into it. So it has to move up and down with the rest of the suspension. But what you may not know, though, is that there are some other liabilities associated with this design. Let me show you what I mean. 
This little red wagon also has a solid front axle, but without the springs and shocks, but it does function essentially the same. Let me show you what I mean. If you're just driving down the road and you're not hitting any bumps, the wheels are perpendicular to the road. They're straight up and down. But let's say you hit a bump on one side. What happens now is the angle of the wheel in relation to the road changes. The top of this wheel is actually tilted in. And because that wheel is connected by the solid axle, the top of that wheel is tilted out. The angle changes in relation to the road. You can actually see the tire's tread lifting off the ground, losing contact with the road. Now, on a rear axle, this isn't a problem because those wheels are not steering the vehicle, but the front wheels do, so you want as much of the tires tread in contact with the road as you possibly can for better handling and control. The Trooper's independent double wishbone suspension allows the front wheels to act independently and travel straight up and down, maintaining maximum tread contact with the ground. Up front, the Grand Cherokee doesn't offer headlamp washers or wipers, and the fog lights that are tacked onto the top of the bumper look like an afterthought. The Trooper's easily cleaned headlamps, combined with the low-mounted and integrated fog lamps, provide optimum visibility in any weather condition. And Trooper's exclusive cornering lamps provide an extra margin of nighttime safety by illuminating the path you're turning onto. Once inside the Jeep, you'll notice the lack of a shift interlock. You'll also notice that there's no automatic down for the driver's power window switch. And just like the Explorer, if you get the optional CD player, you have to give up the cassette. The Trooper's optional automatic transmission features the safety of a shift interlock, which prevents the vehicle from being shifted out of park unless the brake is applied. And a single push on the driver's side power window switch sends the window all the way down. And as I mentioned earlier, when you get a Trooper, you can have your cassette and CD too. The Grand Cherokee's interior is cramped compared to the Trooper's. For carrying cargo, you have seven cubic feet less room behind the rear seat and 10 cubic feet less room when the seat is folded. And the Cherokee's inside mounted spare tire makes the available space less usable. As you can see, the rear seat area has less leg and hip room than the Trooper. This combined with a lower seating position makes the rear seat passenger space less comfortable. Like the Troopers, the rear seat does split, but it doesn't recline and there are no rear headrests. While the Jeep Grand Cherokee is a new design, it shares many of the characteristics of its predecessor. Cramped rear seating area, solid front axle, unibody construction, and limited cargo carrying capacity are all attributes of the old generation Cherokee. The Jeep's advertising slogan is, only in a Jeep, but only in a Trooper do you get a roomy passenger compartment, independent front suspension, solid body on frame construction, extensive skid plate protection, complete undercoating, all aluminum four valve per cylinder overhead cam engine, shift interlock, four wheel ventilated disc brakes, an expansive cargo area with hidden storage compartment, automatic power down driver's window, rear seat headrests, headlamp washers, integrated fog lamps, cornering lamps, better fuel economy, and roadside assistance. When put to the test against its leading competitors on highway and off, Trooper is clearly at the top of its class in capabilities, comfort, quality, performance, and value. Use this information along with your 1993 Isuzu Sales Professionals desk reference, the Just the Facts Pocket Competitive Guide, and monthly issues of Inroads Magazine so that your customers will appreciate the Trooper's overall superiority. And then you too will be at the top.